as Rockefeller University has done for all these years. Thank you for hosting this. Over the course of the 125 years of history of Wiley, we have enjoyed a productive and successful partnership with the scientific community for the advancement of research. We conceive the Wiley Prize in Biomedical Science as a way to recognize and give back to this community. Wiley chose to fo focus on biomedicine because it's an area continuing to experience significant progress and change. Our goal is to recognize specific contributions or a series of contributions that have opened new fields of research or advanced novel concepts or their applications in a particular discipline and demonstrate the nominee's significant leadership in the field. This year's winner, winners, whoops, they're, well, they were there, they're here, Demis Hassabis, John Jumper, and David Baker have indeed made such a contribution. Their work has solved a long-standing question in biology. Can we predict how a protein folds simply based on its amino acid sequence? Their computational approaches provide highly accurate models of protein folds to all researchers in the biolog biological and biomedical fields. This major advance has opened the door to a new frontier of structure-based inquiry into proteins from all domains of life. The AI systems they developed, providing data which is freely available to all researchers, is an outstanding example of how open research is available to further advancements in biomedical research. Our jury consists of your own Tizia DeLong, who is chair of the jury, Kai Salakati and Wayne Hendrickson, both of Columbia University, Joan Stites of Yale, Robert Horvitz of MIT, and also Rick Lifton, who collaborated to make the selection of this year's award recipients. Wayne Hendrickson will serve as the moderator for today's lectures, and a Q&A will follow the three lectures. I'd like to invite Tizia to come up here to help give the awards. Thank you. So thanks, uh, Debbie, for your ever unwavering support for this award. And also thank you to the people from the Wiley Foundation, Wiley Press, for all their hard work on putting these events and our jury committees meetings together. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the jury um, because of their thorough and hard work. The Wiley jury is a little different from most juries I've served on, and that's because we aim to recognize discoveries and breakthroughs before others have. So while on other committees one kind of leans on what prior committees have discovered and dug up and considered, at the Wiley we do it all from scratch. And I think the jury does a really remarkable job coming up with recognition of science that is either spanking new, as today's case, or not so new, but has never been recognized for its real value. Um, and a very good example of what the Wiley jury does best is provided today with Wayne Hendrickson, an expert, renowned structural biologist from Columbia University, who brought the idea to the jury to consider AlphaFold and AlphaFold 2. So it's therefore appropriate that Wayne will be the MC for the speakers today. Thank you so much, Wayne, for doing this job.
Well, th thank you very much. I think this is a, uh, a prize that most people in this audience, both here and on the Zoom, will already understand quite a bit. But nevertheless, let me give you a bit of introduction to the protein folding problem, at least from my perspective and the background to this award. Uh, to, to me, it starts with uh, Chris Anfinson, who did this marvelous experiment, or a series of experiments with his group in the late 50s, early 60s, that took uh, protein ribonuclease, uh, denatured it in a reductive manner so that all of the disulfides were bound and got it folded back together by putting it into the right kind of medium uh, appropriate to what its activity would be like. And it magically folded back, got all of the disulfides correct out of the 105 possible ways that it could be done, it got one, and that protein was now active. That led Anfinson to what he called the thermodynamic hypothesis. The hypothesis that if you took a protein of a given sequence and put it into the correct physiological milieu, it would come to the correct three-dimensionally folded structure for its natural activity. And that in turn led to the, suit, to the pursuit of you know, how does this all happen? And there are a couple of aspects of that. I'm not going to go into all of, the, all of that. But let me just say that very soon after that, in 1960, John Kendrew did the first three-dimensional structure of a protein. So we now knew what it folded up like. And there were a few more in the next years. And the next one that I want to mention, though, is ribonuclease itself, which in 1967 was solved by uh, a couple of groups, uh, David Harker, and Gopi Kartha, and also by uh, Fred Richards and Hal Wyckoff. And that structure looked completely different. Its amino acid sequence, at that time at least, revealed nothing about why it should be different. And subsequently, we've learned a lot about how all of that could proceed. But what transpired uh, was that many things started happening. And in 19 um, 71, there was a conference held at Cold Spring Harbor that brought together everybody who was working on proteins, including me. And uh, at that meeting, it was decided that we've got enough of these guys already that we should start trying to record them somehow. And they went into a, a deposition that was created called the Protein Data Bank. The initial issue of it had seven entries, including mine. <laughs> and. Um, it now has 189,000 entries. So that's a lot of information. But the sequence world, as you all know, I think, is enormously greater. There are 230 million entries in the, in, uh, the protein database uh, called Uniprot. So it led to this whole question of whether we could actually do something about fulfilling Anfinson's prediction by our idea by actually figuring out from the sequences what their structures should be. There are many other aspects of that. You know, what is the actual process by which something folds is another issue. It's another kind of protein folding problem, if you wish. But we're directing our attention to this one of predicting three-dimensional structures from their sequences. And one of the key developments in this is from one of our recipients, David Baker, and his team. And these, both of these uh, projects that we're talking about here are really team science. These, David's uh, group have uh, developed something that is called Rosetta. And I'm sure he'll say something about it. But anyway, Rosetta has developed by uh, David's lab, but also by the acolytes from that lab, everybody has continued to uh, contribute, and it is truly a marvel. Prediction is one part of it. Protein design and many other aspects are part of it, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. The final thing that I want to mention is uh, also key to the story, I think, and it's something that a scientist called um, uh, John Moore, uh, John Moult developed called CASP for critical assessment of structure prediction. 
and CASP has been going on for quite some time, every two years. Uh, some of the depositions to the protein data bank that I mentioned are held back from release to the public, which is normally the process that happens, so that they could be part of a test of whether the, their structures could be predicted. And then at a particular time, they're all released to the participants in this uh, uh, experiment, as Molt calls it, not in a competition. He wants to say it's not a competition, although the people do compete. Um, and that, comp that they get the sequences, and 72 hours later, they submit their results, and these get assessed. And my last little bit is that I, in, in preparing the homework that um, our leader tells us we do, I, I called up John Molt. And I also called up Stephen Burley, who heads the Protein Data Bank. And first from Burley, and then I got it from Molt as well. Um, what transpired is that in, 20, in 2000, when CAS14 happened, uh, Molt called up the Protein Data Bank to see, is there any possibility that these things got leaked? Because we now have a result that is so much better than anything we ever had before that I want to make sure that we can defend that our process is uh, without fault. And I think that, if anything, to me, when I heard that, it just sent chills through me, actually, because it really demonstrates how totally remarkable the advance from AlphaFold was. And the last thing that I'll say before introducing each of the speakers, then, is that um, in the course of all of this, uh, many new developments in this area have also been done by David Baker, but I do want to emphasize that we think that David Baker's work is, stands on its own as a very important and critical contribution for many reasons, some of which you'll, I think, hear about in uh, David's talk about protein design, which is totally remarkable, and not just a calculation. He designs things, he builds them, he tests them, gets their structures, and proves activities when relevant. So I think that's all totally remarkable as well. So with that, I'd like to turn now to introducing the individual speakers, the first of which is uh, Demis Hasebus, who, um, so I'm gonna skip an important part of his story, which is the child prodigy part, <laughs> which is totally remarkable, but let me get him to, College, So he went to university at Cambridge and graduated from there, uh, set up a company called Elixir Studios where he studied games. He's a playful guy. And, um, and sometime after that, I don't know, a couple, three years, he uh, went to a graduate school in neuroscience at University College London where he studied neuroscience and then went on to some postdoctoral studies a little bit of a wanderer and did some bit of time in, in Boston uh, at uh, Harvard and MIT and, and back to UCL. UCL. Uh, after which, he then founded a company called DeepMind. And he co-founded it, I guess, but he's the CEO of, of DeepMind and more recently, a spin-off of that that's relevant, I think, is Isomorphic Labs for which and both of these companies are now part of the Alphabet Group, the Google operation. Um, uh, Demis has uh, many honors to his credit, and I'll just mention that he's a fellow of, of the Royal Society. Demis, could you tell us what you've done? Oh, well, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, and it's um, such a great pleasure to be here and such a great honor to, um, for us to be awarded the uh, Wiley Prize. Uh, and really, John and myself are here on behalf of uh, an amazing, whole amazing team, our AlphaFold team, uh, which is uh, you know, a large team of around 20 people that are responsible for the work that we're going to talk about, uh, and also the wider DeepMind team that's now over 1,000 people and, and researchers and engineers who build a lot of the machine learning uh, and the know-how that ends up going into things like AlphaFold. Um, 
So, uh, you know, it's been wonderful to be here. We've had a wonderful couple of days as well, and thanks to the Rockefeller for, for hosting us too. Um, so at my talk, it's a sort of two-part talk. I'm going to give the first part, and then John's going to give a second part. Uh, for my part of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, our journey to AlphaFold and, and why we chose the protein folding problem as the, as the right problem to tackle uh, and how we sort of developed the AI uh, on the way so that we thought it could be powerful enough to use for scientific problems like protein folding. Uh, and then John will um, take over and talk about a lot of the details, uh, our technical details of how AlphaFold works. So I've, I've called my talk Using AI to Model Biology. Obviously, I'm going to be discussing AlphaFold today, but I think um, it could be just the beginning, we hope, of uh, uh, the use of AI uh, to model biological phenomena. So hopefully this is going to work. Okay. So for when we started DeepMind in 2010, uh, it's quite hard to imagine that now and cast your mind back to that because AI is the kind of one of the biggest buzzwords around at the moment. But back in 2010, when I was um, trying to start DeepMind, uh, almost nobody was working on AI. And uh, trying to get some funding for DeepMind was incredibly difficult to just even get a few pennies together because people were just saying, we know AI doesn't work. We've been trying it at MIT and other places since you know the 90s and early 2000s, and um, it just doesn't do anything very useful. Um, but we felt that, and partly inspired by neuroscience, actually, and how the brain works, and that's why I did a neuroscience PhD, uh, was to get inspiration from the brain and some of the mechanisms and the architectures and the representations the brain uses, so systems neuroscience. So it's not to copy the brain um, directly, because obviously the brain's a biological system versus in silico, um, but some of the principles uh, that we, we felt could be used to um, push forward artificial intelligence. And um, our mission statement for DeepMind was uh, to try and solve intelligence to advance science and benefit humanity. And I just realized as I was preparing for this talk that this is very uh, apt that we're here at Rockefeller because I didn't realize it mirrors obviously Rockefeller's uh, mission statement very well. So, um, so that's a sort of incredible coincidence. Um, but what, what we mean by solving intelligence is that we wanted to um, fundamentally understand what intelligence is uh, and then recreate that in an artificial construct. And what we felt, so there's two parts to this, right, is understanding the phenomena of intelligence and then building it. And then if that was, if we were able to do that in a really general way, we feel that it would be potentially applicable to almost anything. Uh, and specifically for me, my passion, my personal passion, the reason I spent my whole career working up to the point of starting DeepMind and working on AI was to use it for scientific discovery itself. So, um, so that's what we, we set out to do, and that was our original mission statement. So if you can believe us trying to pitch that to venture capitalists in 2010, you can see perhaps the difficulty I had in raising some money. Um, and um, well, the way, specific way we were going to do this was by building general learning systems. So let me just spend a little moment to explain what we mean by that. Um, there's at least two major components to this that came together when we started out DeepMind. Uh, and I think it should, demonstrates the power of these kinds of learning systems versus the um, traditional AI systems in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, which were called expert systems, where you directly program in the solution. Instead of that, we build systems that learn for themselves directly from experience or data uh, for the, from first principles, basically, uh, what that solution should be. And there's two major components to the types of learning systems we build at DeepMind. There's deep learning or deep neural networks, which you're probably most of you have heard of. Uh, and this, that, that, that part of the system is responsible, you can think of, for building a model of how the environment that the, that the, the system finds itself in, how that environment works. And it learns from, directly from data or through experience if it's a kind of learning agent. The second important component is reinforcement learning. And what that does is it uses this model built up by the deep learning to uh, learn how to achieve a goal. So it's, you're given a, a specific goal by the designers of the system and, um, and, and the agent, sometimes we call the system an agent, has to decide what action to take at the next step that will best get it towards its goal. Um, and when the thinking time's finished, it outputs that action. That action then um, may or may not make a, a change to the environment. That drives a new observation a new data point, and then the agent updates its model. So it's an active learning process, right? And of course, why do we, why were we so confident this would work? Because this is the way that uh, animals learn, 
right? And, and in fact, reinforced learning is a very famous result in the 90s that many of you here, if you're neuroscientists, will know from Schultz et al., showing that the dopamine system and dopamine neurons implement a form of reinforcement learning called TD learning uh, to learn uh, uh, what, uh, what to do. So um, together, we, we call these systems deep reinforcement learning systems or deep RL systems, and we basically pioneered their use uh, and what they're able to do in the exciting potential of these systems is that they can potentially discover new, new, new knowledge from first principles that we ourselves, as, even as the designers of these systems, did not know um, how to do. So we built these deep learning systems, uh, deep reinforcement learning systems, and the first thing we tested them on, uh, drawing a little bit on my uh, previous early career, uh, was on games. And um, the reason we chose games, apart from that I love games, all forms of games, is that they're the perfect proving gown for developing advanced AI and testing them efficiently. So, uh, and they're great for all sorts of reasons. One is that they have clear objectives, really easy to specify that goal. Um, and, you know, you could say maximize the score or win a game, uh, and then that will give the reward to the reinforcement learning system. Um, it's easy to quantify metrics so that you know if you're improving, um, and you're hill climbing in the right direction. Um, they're independently designed. There's thousands of games um, that, 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 that human designers have spent years and years designing and building and playing. So um, there's an enormous amount of work to draw on there that one can lean on. Um, it's efficient to test. You can run millions of experiments in the cloud all at once in parallel. Um, and you can also pick games that are increasingly challenging. And you'll see that when I show you the lineage of what we did. Um, so you want to pick, uh, you know, this is the same in all science endeavors, you want to pick a sweet spot of a problem where it's not too easy that the progress would just be incremental, but it's not too hard that it, you're, you're years before your time and any progress would be impossible or imperceptible. So we want to try and pick that sweet spot. And I think we've done that quite well at DeepMind. So we've had a, we've been lucky enough to have a, a few big major breakthroughs on, on the way to um, AlphaFold, which was I'm going to talk about for most of my talk. Um, we started off with Atari games. Most of you in this room are not old enough to remember those, but, but in, the, in the 70s and 80s, that was all the rage. So Space Invaders we're showing here. And that was a huge result we had in, back in 2012, 2013, although it got published in 2014, was our deep reinforcement learning system for the first time, first end-to-end -end system that could play something as complex in a, as an Atari game just from the pixels on the screen, the raw pixels on the screen not told anything else about the game or the rules or how to get a score or win the game or not lose a life. All of that had to discover for itself from first principles. Um, then we took it to uh, probably our most famous, uh, uh, most famous program until AlphaFold came along called AlphaGo. And that was our program to crack the ancient game of Go, um, which is far more complex than chess, much more esoteric. Um, and those expert systems were not able to play Go. Uh, and we managed to use these, um, these learning systems to end up beating the world champion uh, in 2016 in a very famous match uh, in, uh, live in, in Seoul, in Korea, that was watched by 200 million people. And, um, and then we developed that more generally further into AlphaZero, which was our general system, games playing system that could play any two-player game, any two-player game from scratch to world champion level. Um, including beating all of our previous computer versions of the specific games, including AlphaGo at Go. So it was able to beat AlphaGo at Go, as well as play chess and Japanese chess and any game you could, you could, you could throw at it. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, we sort of did the pinnacle of video games, strategy games, a game called StarCraft II, some of you may have played, which was considered to be the pinnacle of strategic games uh, in, in the computer games field. Um, super complex for all sorts of other reasons. It's a partially observable search space. You don't see all the information at once, unlike in chess and Go, and it needs long-term planning. Uh, and we were able to beat the best players in the world on that in, in 2019 too with our AlphaStar program. So those are all our landmarks that built up to, to AlphaFold. Um, and the exciting era that we're in now is that I think we've got to the point where uh, we have sophisticated enough algorithms, uh, we can now uh, apply them to truly challenging problems in science uh, and actually directly to scientific discovery itself. So what do we look for when we're, we're I mean, I'm continually horizon scanning for, for, for interesting problems that are hugely impactful in science, but that might be suitable for the types of algorithms that we work on and that we've developed. And we basically look for three properties. Uh, one is that we um, look for problems that can be couched as huge combinatorial search spaces or state spaces. 
Um, we like that because we feel our systems are very effective in those kinds of domains. And those types of domains are usually too complex or have too much combinatorial complexity for brute force methods to work, right? So you need to do something a little bit cleverer. Um, second thing is we want, we like clear objective functions or metrics to optimize against so that we know uh, our system can hill climb towards a better solution. And then finally, we need quite a lot of data and or ideally it's an and, an accurate and efficient simulation of the underlying phenomena. So if these three, three things hold true, then um, it's a very good kind of candidate problem for our types of um, systems. And it turns out, actually, if you start looking for things with this lens, there are a lot of things, both in industry and in science, that fit um, uh, the bill here. Now, of course, one of those that ticks all of those boxes is the protein folding problem. And, and Wayne actually has already explained what that is, and I'm sure you all know in the audience, but it's, take, it's this problem of uh, taking the amino acid sequence and directly from that predicting the 3D structure of the protein. And of course, there's also, as Wayne mentioned, this was um, kind of this whole 50 year, I suppose, quest was, uh, was or grand challenge was sort of launched by uh, Christian Amfinson um, uh, in the 70s as part of his Nobel Prize lecture. So that was sparked off this 50 year quest. And um, why is this button not working? Um, 50 year grand challenge. And try this. Okay. Um, and so, how did we? Um, uh, so, then there's also, so the big question then is can protein structure prediction problem be solved computationally? And um, there are uh, sort of contemporaries of, of Anfinson, like Leventhal who uh, sometimes talked about as Leventhal's paradox that there are, you know, he estimated 10 to the 300 roughly possible confirmations for an average size protein. Um, and that obviously means you cannot possibly exhaustively sample these confirmations, be totally intractable. You know, there's more, way more than atoms there are, than there are atoms in the universe. And somehow, obviously this is the paradox, is that in nature, uh, uh, these proteins somehow spontaneously fold within, you know, many cases within milliseconds. So for us, this um, AlphaFold project was a sort of long uh, road taken, a long journey taken indirect to this problem. I actually first came across it in my undergraduate studies at Cambridge in the 90s because I had a biologist friend of mine uh, that was obsessed with this problem and would talk about it every moment, uh, you know, in the pub, playing pool, in the, in the, in the dorm rooms. This, he would sort of be obsessed with this problem. He still works on it today, protein structures at uh, LMB and uh, in Cambridge. And uh, he was used to, to talk about this. And I remember that stuck in my head as something that was very interesting and could be maybe approached one day computationally. And I sort of filed that away. Uh, and then I came across it again in the sort of late 2000s, 2009, 10, when I was a postdoc at MIT and um, Foldit had come out, some of you might remember from the Baker Lab, which was a kind of puzzle game made out of protein folding. And it was, a, I think, still probably the best example of a citizen science game where, you know, sort of amateur games players were actually playing a game, but they were also doing some useful science. And I remember some cool things as, you know, there was actually some nature papers and other things, some actual really in important and interesting structures were solved by the gaming community using this Foldit game. And what I was thinking is I was intrigued by that. And I sort of, again, another thing I filed away for a few years was if the best players, you know, could fold real structures um, and, you know, how were they doing this? Obviously they were using their sort of gaming intuition to do it. Um, maybe we could mimic that intuition and perhaps even improve on it in the way we've done for the Go players for playing Go with AlphaGo. And so, um, so that was all sort of the, the background to this. And then the, the other really important point that also Wayne mentioned was the CASP competition and the existence of that. Uh, this is sort of independent benchmark. I think that's super critical. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, huge kudos to John Moult and the CAS organizers for keeping this competition running for 30 years, every two years um, organizing this as a gold standard sort of blind prediction, a blind assessment of structure prediction. Uh, and that was a big factor for us in terms of de deciding to go for and putting the resources in to go for this problem. So um, let me just give you a little bit of history of CASP. Um, so this is the sort of uh, the scores 
of um, measured in, in uh, their, their measurement called GDT, which you can think of as roughly percentage of res residues that you are accurately predicting within a certain tolerance. And, um, and this is the scores of the gray bars here of the winning teams on the hardest category, the free modeling category, uh, their median accuracy on the hardest category uh, over the previous sort of decade um, from CAS 7 to CAS 12, so from 2006 to 2016. And you can see there was sort of little progress for a decade. Um, and we started the AlphaFold program project in 2016, pretty much the day after our AlphaGo match against the um, Korean world champion when we got back um, from that. And we, we kicked off this project and, uh, and sort of built it up over time. And we, our first entry into CAS was in 2018. And we kind of revolutionized the field, I think, looking back on it um, by introducing this sort of cutting edge machine learning that I was talking about earlier that we developed on games and other things and applying it at scale uh, for the first time really uh, to this problem. And we sort of improved the uh, winning accuracy uh, by nearly 50% over the historical uh, uh, trend. And then we, uh, with AlphaFold 2, uh, we, we, we kind of extended the team and we re-architected the whole system, taking our learnings and the experience we had from AlphaFold 1, re-architecting re, uh, everything about it to reach our, our original mission of like actually trying to solve the problem and reaching that. We define that as reaching atomic accuracy. Uh, and we were able to do that uh, in the 2020 competition in CAS 14 um, a couple of years ago. And these are the results from that in terms of median uh, RMSD 95 error. Uh, and you can see the alpha fold two, we managed to get below this critical uh, threshold that John Moll and the organizers of CASP always had told us um, that that was their magic threshold where they would consider the, the, the problem essentially solved uh, of below one angstrom error. Uh, and uh, alpha fold two managed to get a, a median error of 0.96 angstroms. And uh, it was three times more accurate than the next best system at CAS 14, uh, including the systems from Tencent and Baker Labs and Zhang and, and others, uh, and you, who are more closer to a three angstrom error. And, um, and so, you know, this was a kind of amazing result. And you, you heard that wonderful anecdote from, from John Moult that, that uh, Wayne recounted of just making sure that the system somehow, you know, hadn't been circumvented or hacked somehow. Um, and, uh, you know, we were, we were super amazed when we got back the results. Uh, and we got these beautiful uh, images back from, from the competition of our predictions in blue and the, the ground truth in green and how much of a close overlap there was, even in many cases with the side chains as well, um, as with ORF8 here on the left. Now, in order to do this, we had to create an extremely innovative architecture. Um, it's by far the most complex system we've ever built at DeepMind, and we've built quite a few complicated systems, um, but it was, I would say, by far the, big, the, the most complicated and the most number of innovations. I won't go into the details of the architecture because I'll leave that to John in his talk, but I want to just explain some of the key technical uh, takeaways uh, from it. Um, so, you know, one measure of how complex the system was is that it's, it's composed of 32 component algorithms. Uh, and in our Nature paper, we, you know, where we fully described all of our methods, uh, is 60 pages of SI, um, which just, you know, if you, if you waded through all of that, well done. But it's, uh, um, you know, it's just a measure, I think, of the amount of ingenuity that was needed. And the, the other thing was there was no silver bullet in the end. Um, there was actually a whole host of insights and innovations that were needed, and they all needed to be carefully integrated into a whole. And, um, and I think John will talk about the ablation studies we did to show uh, which aspects were needed, and the short answer is all of it. Um, and so the key innovations were we made the system fully end-to-end. -end. Um, uh, there was a recycling stage to kind of refine the structure as we went along. We used a, a special kind of neural network, an attention-based neural network to kind of infer the graph structure of uh, between the residues and kind of build it up iteratively. And then the other important thing is we built in some um, evolutionary, so biological and physical constraints into the system, uh, into the architecture directly, but without impacting the learning. And that's a really pretty tricky balance to get in machine learning, to, but to make sure that the constraints you put in don't harm the learning that comes on top but actually add to it. And this has been a huge research effort for us five years. Um, and you know, it has peaked 20, 20 plus people uh, from a very multidisciplinary team. So we had chemists and physicists, and of course, biologists, as well as the uh, machine learning people. So um, the other thing about the system was that it was very fast. 
So uh, actually, once we, once we, we finished the CAS competition uh, around over Christmas, actually, we, we realized that we were sort of thinking about how could we release the benefits of this in the, in, the, in the most beneficial way to the scientific community? Should we put up a server and let people sort of submit structures? But we actually realized we could fold entire proteomes because, um, and we might as well just try and fold everything because um, uh, it was so fast. The system was so fast to, to, to make an inference. So, you know, order of minutes, uh, to predict an average side protein on a single GPU machine. So this is very much not a uh, story about computation. We needed you know, a lot of computation to, to kind of build the system and explore the system, but it was actually about the innovations that were in the end, the algorithmic innovations that were the things that mattered. So we folded the whole entire human proteome, all 20,000 proteins, um, and experimental coverage at this point in time was 17% of the human proteome. And we managed to more than double that with uh, predictions of very high accuracy predictions that we think are you know, sub angstrom quality uh, are straight out of the box. And about 58% at what we term high accuracy, and John will explain a little bit about what we mean by those terms, but it basically means that we think the backbone is reliable. Um, and then the rest, uh, and it's an open research question, we, think we have quite a lot of evidence so far that um, uh, where AlphaFold predicts low confidence is that they may actually be intrinsically disordered regions. Um, so it's pretty interesting to flip it on its head and use AlphaFold as an intrinsic disorder predictor. So we think this is the most complete and accurate picture of the human proteome ever. And we published that as well simultaneously with our methods paper. And then furthermore, we spent a lot of time with our wonderful collaborators at Emble EBI building a database uh, uh, built in with into their main Uniprot databases that um, has all of these structures uh, for the human proteome and then a further 20 model organisms uh, for free and unrestricted access for any kind of use. Um, and this has uh, sort of allowed us to, I think, maximize the scientific benefit in, and impact, uh, hopefully for the, you know, the wider research community and eventually all of humanity, hopefully. So now we have all the more than a million predictions in the database today. We've We've done all the Swiss prot ones, and also that we've specifically focused on neglected tropical diseases because often they don't have many structures. Um, we think they could be particularly impactful for drug design and uh, for those types of diseases that affect the developing world more. And the community has already done within you know six months some incredible things. Actually, many of you, we've had lots of fun talking to all of you about how you've used it uh, to you know model very complex biology like the nuclear pore complex, as I talked about the as a as a state of the art. Uh, protein disorder predictor, the, the World Health Organization asked us to fold all the, all, the, all the structures in the top 30 pathogens they think could cause a future pandemic and so on. And it's also helped experimentalists actually resolve their, um, their experimental data and structure. So it's been amazing to, um, to see uh, what the impact has been. Um, 350,000 people, uh, researchers have already used the database. Uh, and, you know, we're we very nice for us to win a lot of um, awards and accolades at the end of last year from science and, and nature. So what we plan to do next is, 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 is literally try and fold every protein in existence. As Wayne said, there's so much more um, out there uh, and more added all the time to these databases. And, and we aim to do uh, sort of, you know, most of Uniprot over the next year. Um, and our future work is looking at all sorts of things, protein complexes. We've already released a new version of AlphaFold that, 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 that can do that. Disorder proteins, point mutations, ligand docking, and so on. Um, and so there's a huge amount to go. Um, and I just want to finish by saying that I think, you know, potentially this is a, hopefully a new era of what we call digital biology. I think at its most fundamental level, biology can be thought of as an information processing system. Um, but, you know, life's very complex and it's an emergent process. So one could say that it's maybe too complex to describe mathemat just mathematically. I don't think we're gonna have a Newton's laws of motion type of elegance for, for the, how the cell works, it's too complicated. But I think AI might be the perfect tool for that, the perfect description language for that type of complexity. And perhaps AlphaFold is a proof of concept that that could be possible. So I just wanna thank the, the PDB and Wayne's fantastic story of uh, you know, everyone submitting to that. And, and over the years, obviously this couldn't have been done with all that information that was um, put in there uh, by experimentalists over, over many decades and experimental biology computer, uh, community. And then obviously our wonderful teams and collaborators at EMBL, CASP and the PDB. Thank you. I just want to remind people that we will have questions at the end and the people out there in the Zoom world, please put your 
questions into the chat as you think of them or as you remember them now for this past talk. So our next speaker is John Jumper, as you've already been told would happen. So let me introduce John by uh, telling you a little of his background. Uh, he was uh, an undergraduate at Vanderbilt University where he graduated summa cum laude in physics and math, after which he did a master's degree in MPhil at the University of Cambridge in theoretical condensed matter physics. After that, he came to New York and worked for D.E. Shaw for about three years. Uh, and I like to think that he learned about proteins there. Um, he then went on um, to do uh, a PhD at the University of Chicago in uh, essentially theoretical chemistry with Carl Fried and Tobin Sosnick, and then uh, spent a bit of time more in the labs there, but then came to DeepMind, where he's been since that time, uh, working uh, since 2018 as the project lead for this alpha uh, fold operation. Um, and as you've heard already just a minute ago, he's recognized um, by science and nature as the breakthrough of the year, uh, together with the whole team, of course, but individually as well by various uh, record sayings in the Time Top 100 and the Nature Top 10 and so on. And I'm certain he'll soon be at the top, top. Um, so that's uh, John Jumper, who will now tell us more about AlphaFold. Thank you very much, John. Thank you so much. And I want to start by reemphasizing something that Dimas said, that he and I are here on behalf of the AlphaFold team. And it's by far the most incredible team I've worked with. And just really, really incredible to see people drawn from kind of across computational sciences, physics, biology, and coming together to all be a very large team of structural biologists. And it's been just the best group I've ever worked with by far. And so what I want to tell you about today, and you know, as we look at this kind of complicated wiring diagram for a circuit that has you know, animals and residue pairs and all these things in it, what I really more wanna tell you about and coming from computational biology is how we see an alpha fold reflected kind of what we understand about proteins and how did really, you know, AlphaFold is two things coming together is this incredible breakthroughs at DeepMind and elsewhere and how we build deep learning systems, how we understand systems that can learn from data and how that was brought together, together with what we understood about proteins that has been done by experimental and theoretical biologists and chemists. And how is that reflected and how did that come together to make this possible? And so, when we start, we should start kind of, you know, with the schematic of the problem and the way, and of course, what Anfinson told us is this uh, first bit is that the sequence determines the structure, um, essentially via physics, especially for small proteins. And this is the relationship we're trying to capture, but that's an extraordinarily difficult relationship to capture. So we have to cheat. And this was um, an idea realized by many researchers over the years is, well, there's another way we can work and we can bring evolution into it in a powerful way. And so we can say that the structure of the protein is preserved over long evolutionary timescales, at least approximately. And so when you look at the evolutionary pattern, when you look at the set of um, related proteins to this protein sequence homologs, that um, they contain the imprint of the structure across evolution. And this constraint has uh, forced itself onto the evolutionary timeline. So there's this evolutionary structure prediction, which I like to think of as kind of Bayesian prediction of how do we do the A-causal thing? If the structure in a sense caused a certain effect on the evolutionary history, how do we invert that and look at the evolution and go back to the structure? And the most important thing from a deep learning point of view, right? you spend a lot of time on the inputs and the outputs. And the really, really important part to note here is that, well, if you provide the evolutionary history as an input, then you can really get strong constraints on the structure that give you a lot more information and bring this problem for very hard to solve. And we haven't yet solved uh, sequence to structure in the absence of evolutionary information, uh, except via for design proteins and other special cases. But we can, by bringing this all together, 
make really, really powerful tools to find the structure and to solve the question that Anthonson said should be solvable if we were just clever enough. And kind of the second part of the story has been this incredible mathematical, technological, computer science development around deep learning and has given us these incredible building blocks for, build, for making learning systems. And here we've got these incredible tools and these are some of the standard if you work in the field or recognize convolutional and other kind of building blocks pieces that you can use to make these systems and they're deep learning systems because you stack them one after another until it's very deep. And they're very generic and they're incredible, but in some ways they're too good and too generic that they can approximate arbitrary functions, they can do anything. And that means that they don't specifically take advantage of our scientific understanding. And so you've got the kind of incredible general tools that have to be fused either in how you set the problems or in our case, in how you build the deep learning system itself to specialize or innovate on these systems in order to make them right for the scientific problem. And that's what made, I think it's such a fun and incredible problem to work on is that some days you put on your deep learning hat and you think exactly about how the numbers propagate and how wide this is and all these things. And then sometimes you put on your biologist hat and then you say, well, gee whiz, is this really accounting for coevolution or is this really accounting for the geometry of the situation? And going back and forth has been incredibly kind of fertile. And in terms of the principles that we used in order to create, create AlphaFold, and aside from the many new pieces, I think the principles are fewer in number. And really it was to try and build these physical and geometric insights into the network itself. We didn't want to take an off the shelf uh, network that you can train to recognize cats and also have it do proteins. And in CAS13, that's a lot of what we did is the innovation was around quite standard neural networks. Here, we thought that we could get quite a, lit, quite a bit more efficiency by working on new blocks within the network. We needed to uh, kind of obey this, this grand principle of neural networks, which is ask for what you want. And in this sense, uh, an end in system where we go from the sequence in and we want the structure out. And you know, when you start with these systems, they give the wrong answer again and again, but then over the process of training, over the process of the, using the incredible data in the PDB, um, including Wayne's, that, you, uh, that it can learn to start to give the right answer. And then we started to kind of play with exactly how we incorporated this knowledge. And we actually de-emphasized primary sequence. There are some places where we don't even force the network to make a chain because it turns out to be very beneficial. That's something learned. That instead, the most important part is this tertiary structure in the end. And how do you rapidly get uh, residues to communicate as the network is understanding what is close how does it handle its uncertainty? And how does it kind of iteratively build the structure? And I'll show some videos later of how that uh, was realized in practice. And so if we take a specific case, a specific kind of substructure of this, and we'll take this Evo former block, and it's the most expensive and most important for accuracy uh, part of the neural network. And kind of, I wanna tell you how it reflects what we think about biology. And if you think, okay, I said, I wanna understand say, geometry or physics, and I want to understand evolution, well, let me give you two things that represent that. I shall give you uh, the multiple sequence alignment, that is our representation of evolution. And in this case, we don't use correlations or coevolution. We simply say, we know these data are important, so we should provide it to the network in a raw form. Um, and this also is important for handling things like spurious matches or other questions. And then the kind of residue pairs, this is our representation of geometry. And we evolve that over the course of the network in ways that are what I would call semantic, that respect how we want the network to have solved the problem. So here we use a mechanism, very powerful mechanism in deep learning now, attention to kind of, as a, as a mechanism that is able to bias itself to spatially close residues. And in fact, what we will see is that this kind of operation as the network starts to understand the structure, things that will be close at the end or that it understands to be close, it'll start building very close and dynamic communication relationships between. And in fact, if you think about how should you understand the multiple sequence alignment, how would a biologist understand it? Well, if they know the structure, they would start to say, well, this residue and that residue are close and they should have a very close relationship. So in fact, our representation of geometry, this residue pair data is used to bias the attention in a semantic way. So this is basically drawing a connection between evolutionary sequences biased by the residue pair data and all, and all the time we're thinking, okay, we want this to happen. Now, what exactly should be the nature of that connection? The learning systems are very good at figuring out. 
And so what we often found is we built the right connections. We, you know, much like a good advisor had the right people talk to each other and they'll figure out what to say. But we wanted this kind of semantics built in. And then similarly, as you think about how do you move information from here down to here, well, you take an outer product with a type of generalized correlation. And so this lets you implement coevolution like ideas. And then we have a third interaction, which is uh, something that is inspired by enforcing the triangle inequality of geometry, but we have a, a specific 3D interaction. And so we're starting to build, and obviously, you know, this also required a lot of experimentation like real lab work does, but we started to build these blocks that represented the kind of what we knew about proteins. And we have other things that represent side chains and residues, et cetera. And we started to build this into how we built the neural network. And we started to see incredible advances in the efficiency. And you know, one of the wonderful things about CASP is not only is it blind, but everyone has essentially the same data, that all good structural data is in the PDB. And so it really is, if you build the right kind of structures, this enables these networks to learn much more efficiently. And it kind of biases you instead of being the very generic notion of attention. Now we have this thing that is partially specialized to protein biology and physics. And that turns out to be extremely important in terms of what it's able to learn and what it's able to do. And then there was this kind of experiment we did after as we were writing, well, actually, I think as we were preparing the first talk on AlphaFold and we said, well, we, we kind of believe that it's got to build the structure and it's got to improve it and all these things. How can we prove it? And so AlphaFold is a neural network and it is exactly 192 uh, layers deep, right? So no matter what the size of the protein is up to what fits in AlphaFold, 192 layers later, it's going to give you an answer. And what we found, what we figured out is, well, we could train something for every layer. We could add a little piece that says, give me a guess of the structure at layer 36, right? And so we, we took the frozen or, you know, an unchanged alpha fold and we attached each of these kind of computational probes. And we said, give me, didn't know in a sense in training that it was going to be asked this, but what's your best guess? And what we got actually out of it was fascinatingly almost dynamical movies. And I used to work in molecular dynamics and these feel pseudo dynamical. And what we're really seeing is that the course of AlphaFold and most of the network is once it's identified kind of a course hypothesis that's uh, driven I think in large part by the evolutionary context in many cases, well then it refines that very precisely and it has this incredible kind of physical chemical notions of what comes together. And if you look for example, in the bottom left corner of this larger protein and apologies to those who are in Zoom, you can see it kind of exploring and rebuilding the part in the bottom left where some regions, for example, here are very well understood. And so we're seeing these kind of principles in which it is iteratively rebuilding its understanding of the protein simply because at the end of this network, it will be accountable to resembling the experimental structure. And the other kind of really important part to think about is the PDB representing the output of the structural biology community is incredibly diverse. Um, so diverse, in fact, that most PDB structures are missing, oh, dear, the bullet points are a bit off, but are missing um, key context, right? Oh, well, this is a zinc binding site, or in our case, we worked at single chain prediction. So even in this case, we we're predicting as one of these three color chains. We're missing quite a lot of context. And the neural network is, in fact, quite insensitive to this. And things like we don't tell it what are membrane proteins, although it's very identifiable. And if you want a general and useful structural biology system that covers structural biology, you really do have to be tolerant to this notion of missing context because there's no way when you work at the genome or metagenomic scale that you're going to know the correct biophysical or biological context for each of these sequences. And we do observe that. And the other thing we observe that's kind of interesting and I should point it out very specifically is alpha fold is very good at novel folds, has basically the same relationship between you need enough sequences in your multiple sequence alignment, but is extremely robust even on novel folds. And it's because it's working at kind of the physical local geometric layer where this is well understood rather than doing say fold matching. And so we see this kind of tool that's in incredible in a way that's very hard coming from a community like molecular dynamics, where you specify all million atoms in your system in the finest detail and you put in the right number of chloride uh, ions and everything else. You can't really do that at the scale we need for bioinformatics. And so it's very important to have these systems that are tolerant to the diversity of conditions in experimental biology and creates lots of interesting opportunities. And we see it in all sorts of fun ways. Like one of the earliest we notice is if you have a protein, uh, a heme protein, 
then uh, it, there will be a heme shaped hole in the middle in the sense the algorithm almost knew it was there and left the correct size hole because in training data, proteins that look like that had a heme shaped hole and it will even coordinate it appropriately. Now, as we've explored and kind of the principles we hope we built and further experiments reinforce how we think alpha fold build structure, and I'll, I'll say think, but we're reasonably confident, is that the global structure arises from local interactions, from local constraints. This is very different than crystallography or cryo-EM where the global structure arises or where the local structure arises from a global superposition of many experimental particles. Um, this does mean that missing just a few interactions will give a different domain packing, although often we do get domain packings or inter-protein uh, inter interactions. But often we have very accurate, even if we're at let's say one angstrom RMSD, which is not an especially good crystal structure, we often have very good side chain rotamers. Um, and side chains are generally predicted well wherever the backbone is predicted well. So we see our side chain accuracy coming from our backbone accuracy in a very direct way. Uh, we think also, and maybe this is the most speculative part, that as alpha fold is building these structures, it seems to resolve other regions. And so what we really see is that it's building on its own knowledge over these 192 computational steps. And this is based a lot on local kind of understanding of physical and geometric constraints. We'll also say, and this is, I think a consequence of the previous slide, it doesn't have a global notion of free energy or stability. So if you introduce a destabilizing mutation, you won't see alpha fold respond. And I think a large region, reason for that is in the diversity of data within the PDB. There are so many conditions, so many exceptions, biology is filled with exceptions, very hard to develop this global notion of stability that is much easier to think about on small proteins, um, et cetera. And so this is really an area for future work. But one other thing that we did, and as we were really getting serious, and in fact, the first release of AlphaFold 2, almost AlphaFold 2, uh, was for some uh, structures without uh, templates from SARS-CoV-2, is how in the world do we know if we're right? And really, measures of uncertainty are very difficult in deep learning. You're talking about a system that will often have more, more parameters than the amount of data uh, in what it's learning from, which is a really incredible thing from a statistical perspective. But, and so it has the power to memorize its training data. How do you know if it's correct? But what we did find, and it's very, very important that we knew, and we knew that, you know, and we hope, our biggest hope was that biologists are gonna look at the structure and do a different experiment. We want them to know if they're doing the right thing or if they're chasing ghosts. And so we took a very, very direct route where we said, well, let's just try the dumbest thing possible. We'll just ask the algorithm how much error it made. And so we, we directly, the model will produce a structure. There will be another connection off here where at training time it was told, well, the error of the structure you just produced or the accuracy in, in this case LDBT is 70 and it will be trained to give 70. And this works extremely well. And the model is quite aware um, of when it doesn't know, which is quite interesting. And, and what we have found in fact is that we can give pretty good guidance and this is kind of encapsulated in these colors that greater than 90 on this predicted accuracy means probably even good side chains and really at the kind of competitive with experiment, you start arguing about states and other and crystallization conditions. Greater than 70, we believe reliable backbone, but maybe don't trust the side chains. And then less than 50, and this is a story I'll talk about in the next, is really um, starting to really think disordered. And this was all absolutely the scariest moment in the project where we started producing structures, I think for Uniprot first, and we start looking at them and boy, did they not look like PDB structures. And we saw all sorts of noodly bits. I think Twitter has started to taking to call them spaghetti. Um, but, uh, but we started noticing all these things and we said, my goodness, are we only good at things in the PDB? And we were really worried about that for a while. And then we started to look in Uniprot and other resources and say, well, actually, these are all annotated as disordered regions or at least a large number of them. And in fact, some analysis we did in the paper and later more careful work independently by uh, Blunt Mazaros and Norman Davey said, well, actually, AlphaFold being unconfident is a very competitive disorder predictor with the state of the art. And so really what we're seeing, and we should say that it's disorder or unstructured in isolation. There'll be things, for example, that are bound in some sort of um, obligate complex that we won't pick up, say the green strand here. But we do see very often that low AlphaFold confidence is actually a really good measure of disorder and starting to help us get at and really, really interesting to see the reaction of biologists. Sometimes we can give them a great answer. Sometimes we could say, you know, really probably you should talk to your local IDR expert. 
The other really interesting part of the story is, and this started actually with some work uh, on Twitter, I think almost a week we came out um, by different people saying that, well, you know, even though AlphaFold was built for single chain structure prediction, you know, multi-chain isn't so different. What if I just put a glycine linker in there and started to obtain really good results on some complexes and really saying when one was with the glycine linker, one was with a different technical trick, that in fact, actually, this is probably the state of the art of predicting complexes is just to stick glycines in between uh, your two unrelated proteins. And most interestingly, actually, you can do quite a lot of this. It works better with coevolution, but in fact, quite a lot of it works without any paired sequences for those in the field. And so this has become a really interesting story. And at the time, we had been busy working on, uh, you know, alpha, what would be alpha fold multiple when we released it, but protein interaction work. But we're already seeing quite a lot of protein interaction work coming out and some really incredible structures. And later, in a, a month or two later, we were able to release alpha fold multiple, which has a, a pretty large increase in accuracy, even over uh, using these kind of tricks. And here, what we're really saying is doing a, basically the same architecture and applying it to the multimeric interaction problem, we can make a lot of progress. Now, this is not yet, I would say, more work in progress than AlphaFold itself. Uh, most, more specifically, not getting a good structure out of this is not such a good sign that things don't interact. But getting a confident structure is a pretty good sign they do. And this is, I think, a really exciting area for what it can start to tell us about the interactome. And we're very excited about work on that. And I think to the kind of larger point, like where do we think of deep learning methods and AlphaFold in the, in the larger community? And I, I, I like to think of it as an amplification of the incredible work of experimentalists. And it's just still to me the most humbling thing in the world that you know, multiple years of PhD student work or something that we can hope to produce by running this network. And that's like very, very different than a lot of deep learning has done incredibly well on say human data and said, well, I can do this as well as a human. Well, Humans don't predict protein structure. And it's this incredible work of experimental biologists. And really we produce this like diverse but sparse set of experimentally determined structures. And AlphaFold and deep learning in general is a way to amplify that out to get this huge coverage. And just for us to start to think about what, what is it gonna mean as structural biology starts to keep up with the genomics revolution. And we expect this pattern to repeat many times over. And we think it's gonna be a really interesting pattern as we start to meet the complexity of biology with neural networks. And with that, I wanna thank um, the same set of people that Dimas did, uh, which is the people that work on AlphaFold, the human proteome, incredible collaborators at EMBL, and a lot of really great scientific advice for making this really useful CASP and the, the incredible assessment and absolutely in the experimental community which made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, John, that was terrific. Uh, I'll turn now to introducing David Baker. Uh, I even see a picture of him emerging. Maybe that will be shown soon. Uh, no, we'll see his slides soon, perhaps. Anyway, so a bit about David Baker. David was an undergraduate at Harvard University uh, and went to do a PhD at UC Berkeley with Randy Schechtman and was a postdoc with David Agard at UCSF. Uh, and after that was recruited to the place he is now, the biochemistry uh, department at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, since 2000, he's been also uh, associated with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I won't spend, I won't take any more of his time, but uh, just to point out that he has uh, been recognized by many things before the Wiley Prize. I'll just mention two. Uh, he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and he won the 2021 Breakthrough Prize. David, take it away. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I, I'd like to just start out by, by thanking the uh, Wiley Foundation for this great honor. I, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person number of reasons, including I have a student whose thesis defense is coming up in a few minutes and was absolutely distraught at the idea I wouldn't be there. I want to thank Wayne for uh, Wayne Hendrickson for his uh, you know, really nice introduction. He's been, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really special because he's been one of my longtime scientific uh, heroes and really has done a huge amount to define the problem that you're hearing about today. I want to thank uh, 
Demis and John for the work that you just that you heard about. I mean, it's really made uh, made what I do a lot more fun, and we've incorporated a lot of their ideas. And then finally, I wanted to thank all the really amazing people in my group now and that I've worked with in the past. Um, as Wayne said, building uh, Rosetta has really been a community effort, and I just really want to thank everyone who's been involved, including the folded players who are playing the game that that uh, Dennis um, uh, mentioned. So. Um, uh, since you've just heard a beautiful, beautiful um, talks from Demis and uh, John about protein structure prediction, I'm, I'm not going to talk about protein structure prediction using Rosetta Fold in this talk. Instead, um, uh, as Wayne alluded to, I'm going to really focus on protein design. And protein design is, is you can think of it as the inverse problem. So in protein structure prediction, you go from amino acid sequence to protein three-dimensional structure and function. In protein design, you start with a protein function or a protein structure that doesn't exist, and you design an amino acid sequence that folds to that structure. And importantly, as Wayne mentioned, we, once we have designed the sequence that is um, to fold up into a particular structure, we can then experimentally test it by going to the lab and making the protein. And so for many years, we've been um, developing uh, this Rosetta-based method for protein structure prediction. And it's a physical model. So we, we try and describe the energetics of hydrogen bonding and um, Van der Waals interactions and all the other sorts of interactions that stabilize proteins as, in as, in as accurately as possible. And it's really based on the principle you know, that uh, Wayne referred to or that elucidated by, by Amphens that proteins fold to their lowest free energy states, thermodynamic hypothesis of protein folding. So in that picture, to predict structure, you have to, you have, to have an accurate energy model, uh, and then you have to search the space for the lowest energy structure. To design new proteins, you, um, you need to design a sequence whose lowest energy state is the design structure. Now, with the, um, with the deep learning methods that, um, that Demis and John have really far more than anyone else introduced into the field, there's now a new approach to protein design um, rather than energetic space, one can take advantage of the very rich sequence to structure information that these models contain and invert it for protein design. So in my talk today, I want to give you a few vignettes of, of sort of this physically based protein design and then how deep learning is now providing completely new approaches to designing proteins. Uh, so um, the coronavirus has been in all of our minds for the last couple of years. And we at uh, Longjin Cao and Brian Coventry uh, we're developing general methods for um, designing proteins to bind to any arbitrary site on any arbitrary target protein. The basic concept is given a protein structure you want to just make a design a binder for, uh, you, design this, you, you basically design a sequence which will fold up into a shape that's shape complementary to that structure and also um, chemically complementary. Um, and uh, the paper describing this actually just came out in Nature last week, so I, I won't have time to go into the method in very much detail. But um, so they took the, the coronavirus receptor binding domain and used this approach to design very small proteins that bind with very, uh, that, that make very low energy interactions uh, with uh, the, the receptor binding domain. These are completely unrelated to, uh, to naturally occurring proteins, but they have sequences that Rosetta predicts folds up into structures that are then predicted to bind the target. Um, and just these are, um, these are kind of remarkable proteins. Um, so this is, uh, this is a 55 residue protein that uh, is very, very stable and it binds the, the virus extremely tightly um, with about 20 picomolar affinity, despite its small size. Uh, when the cryo-EM structure was determined in David Beesler's lab, uh, uh, it, we, we were delighted to see that it bound, this protein not only bound very tightly, but it bound in exactly the way we had designed. So here's the um, structure of the, 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 the spike. The spike protein, remember, has three chains. And he, this small ribbon here is the design binding protein. And when they're superimposed, we can superimpose the design, the computational model, that what Rosetta predicted was the lowest energy state for the sequence and the bound complex on the actual um, uh, cryo-EM structure, which is in magenta and, and teal here, you can see they're very, very similar. And this holds even down to the side chains. Um, and uh, one of the powers of protein design is one can build up uh, more complex systems in kind of a hierarchical way. So as variants started appearing, we, uh, we made this protein even more potent 
by taking the, the three domains that could bind simultaneously to the three receptor binding domains on a virus and, um, and join them in a, uh, a trimer, uh, a design trimer. And, and this, and this is, you see the cryo-EM structure here, that this structure essentially forms a tripod on top of the virus. And in, I'm not gonna show you a lot of like, large body of cell culture and animal data, but this, these, this protein uh, has um, effectively neutralizes all variants of the coronavirus that have been tested so far. So it's being currently developed for clinical use as a nasal spray. So that that was um, so that was um, a, a very that was the design of a very static system of this protein that folds into a rock-like structure that binds. But we can also design dynamic systems now, and this is essentially a designed molecular device uh, which has two states: a dark state and a light state. And in the dark state, uh, one of the binding domains I just described is is caged, so it can't bind. And in this case, what we've done is to cage the binding protein I just told you about for coronavirus. So when the virus is present, the thermodynamics of binding to the, to the virus, uh, which is the target in this case, drive flipping of the switch and reconstitution of luciferase uh, uh, fluorescence that's sort of illustrated in this movie on the right. And um, this is a, a very, we, very general concept. We've applied this to make sensors for many different types of compounds. And you can see it's quite fast. So here the system is, uh, is dark. And then if the, there's coronavirus or coronavirus protein in the vicinity, then it competes, then, then the, it drives opening the switch and we get emission of light. Um, so another type of problem that we've had a lot of interest in, it is designing larger assemblies. And what I want to tell you about today is designing larger assemblies um, that incorporate as one of their two structural components, antibody molecules. And while I've tended to be, my lab is really focused on completely de novo design, building proteins and assemblies completely from scratch. The reason we chose to incorporate antibody molecules is they're really widely used um, as therapeutics. And we thought we could, if, if they were actually structural components of a nano cage, there could be all sorts of interesting properties. So we designed pentameric proteins that hold antibodies at just the right orientation to drive the formation of these icosahedral structures and then tetrameric proteins, I should say, Robbie Devine, the graduate student in the group did this, that, that, that bind to the constant region of antibodies just the right way to form an icosahedron. And then other design proteins that form these other sorts of structures out of antibodies. And we solved the structures of all of these. I'm not, I'm not gonna show you those structures today. I just want to say that they've been very interesting both for potentiating uh, uh, signaling. So for example, if we take an anti-death receptor antibody, and we, ge we generate these um, kind of these nano antibody nanoparticles from them, they're quite, quite effective at killing uh, tumor cells. So we're very interested in this as, as a potential uh, cancer treatment. But what I want to tell you a little bit more in more detail is the potential of these as delivery of vehicles. Now, the original designs, as you saw, were pretty spindly. Uh, for example, this octahedral design has this um, a hole in the middle, so it wouldn't really be good for delivering a cargo. But Aaron Yang, a graduate student in the lab, designed a trimeric plug that fits into this hole perfectly. And what's more, she designed it to be pH dependent. So I'm showing you here now, this is the cryo-EM structure determined by Andrew Borst here. And I'm showing you three views. So this is the view down the, the tetramer. This is the, um, you can think of in the face of the octahedron. This is, and this is looking down the, uh, Aaron's uh, trimeric plug. Now she's, this is uh, very recent data, but she's made versions of this where this, that, that come off at different pHs. And so in particular, she has versions that come off at even at, at, at pH six, not, not that low. Um, and so the idea is that we can target this to any cells we want by, by simply incorporating the relevant antibody. You can basically incorporate any antibody you want into these structures and then they'll self-assemble. Um, and, and then, so you target to the cells, the, 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 the particle gets taken up and then, uh, the car, then in the endosome, which has lower pH in this range, the plug comes out and delivers this cargo. And we have some very preliminary, to my student who's defending his thesis in a few minutes, it's gonna describe very exciting um, uh, prime editing results with uh, this approach. Um, and then the final example I want to give you of pre-deep learning design is the design of machines. So they're marvelous machines in nature and Alexei Corbet uh, wanted to set out to make them uh, from scratch. So he designed uh, rings and axles, and he developed methods for, assemb for assembling 
the rings on the axles, as shown here. And he designed a, a wide variety of different systems, some of which I'm showing here. So these are taking different axles and different types of rings and then putting them together. And he has um, looked at these by electron microscopy. Some of them form relatively well-defined structures. In other cases, the rings um, seem to be rotating, undergoing rotational diffusion around the axles. And that corresponds to flatter rotational energy landscapes than the case where we see discrete structures. So now we're trying to follow these by single molecule fluorescence and couple them to an energy source, um, either light or, or a chemical fuel driven uh, to drive this rotational process. And just showing you uh, some of the substates that we can distinguish for uh, that better defined system, which actually has two different rings on the same axle. So now I'm gonna to switch to what to using deep learning for protein design. And the basic idea is that given a network, or this is, I'm gonna show you different ways of doing this, but one way is what we call uh, network hallucination. So given a network uh, that takes amino acid sequences to protein structures, um, instead of giving it a natural amino acid sequence, we can give it a random amino acid sequence, put it through the network. And of course, it's not predicted to form much of a structure at all. So we can then optimize the sequence using as a metric uh, uh, um, simply the output of the network. How well is it the, net, the network uh, predicted to produce a defined structure? So in, in sort of machine learning language, this is expectation maximization. And so just to show you what that looks like, if we start with a completely random sequence and we predict the, the, the contact map, so these are contacts, res, these are contacts between residues close together, these are between residues far away. At the beginning, there's very few contacts at all, but as more and more as the sequence is optimized, uh, we get better and better defined contact maps, which correspond to uh, defined three-dimensional structures. And when we made genes encoding these, oops, let's see. Um, when we made genes encoding these and uh, solve structures in collaboration with Guy Monteoni's lab, we were very happy to say that these computer hallucinations actually folded up. Now, just to show you where this has gone, um, last, uh, starting in the winter quarter, first year graduate students do rotations, then they were given the project of, of um, doing the same hallucination, but with uh, requiring symmetry, both in internal structure, this repeat structure, and in overall oligomeric state, but not specifying anything else at all. So, and what came out were these giant rings that, um, uh, that these were starting from completely random sequences. We got sequences that were predicted to form these giant rings. And Alex E. Corbet solved the cryo-EM structures. And you see these are quite remarkable structures. There's not really anything like them that exists in nature. Um, they're, they're quite large, 10 nanometer across. Um, and uh, so it shows you can really, these, the networks can really come up with things that would be very difficult to do using traditional protein design, where you first have to be able to build up such a backbone um, and then design a sequence. Um, and the, as you can guess, Alex is now using these for the next generation of motors. Um, so a second way in which we're using deep learning is to make new enzymes. So we can now use the hallucination approach to, to, to design uh, new proteins that have pockets that are perfect size for a substrate. In this case, this is work by Andy Ye, who, who chose a luciferase substrate. And he designed a protein that um, designed, designed the backbones using this deep learning hallucination approach, then designed side chains that hold the substrate really, really well. And he got, he was able to make luciferases that are very, very bright that have catalytic efficacy comparable to naturally occurring luciferases. And as you saw, the, um, uh, the, um, the binding pocket was very, very snug. So unlike naturally occurring luciferases, which have very broad substrate specificity, and these luciferase is very, very specific, which is going to, I think we're, we, we're very excited about for multiplex imaging in cells. Um, and the last thing I want to tell you about is we can, uh, we can use this, um, uh, these approaches to actually build a wide variety of functional proteins by requiring during the sequence optimization process, not only that they fold up to a defined structure, but that structure have a particular motif that, for example, could be an enzyme active site or um, a region that uh, an antibody interacts with um, or, actually, or a protein-protein interface. I'm just gonna give you one example of this. This is the respiratory syncytial virus and there's a huge need for better vaccines. So there have been, it's known that antibodies can bind very potently to these sites, but there hasn't been really a good way of making proteins that display these regions. So using these hallucination methods, um, Zhu Wang designed proteins 
which uh, basically he fixed this motif and then hallucinated the rest. Um, and uh, he's been making these proteins in the lab and it's very exciting as, as you see here, the first designs are binding the antibodies. Um, and, uh, uh, and as I said, we're using this technique to um, approach uh, a, a wide variety of functional design problems. But there's another way of looking at the network. And so um, Ming Kyung Bak developed Rosetta Fold um, inspired by John's talk at, at CAST Originally, just as a method for predicting structure from sequence of structure, as John described for AlphaFold. But we realized after that that we could think of it as a more general sequence to structure model. Um, and, the same, and, and you're all familiar with how when you type, when, you, when you're writing on your word processor, you write a few words and then it will try and autocomplete. It's because it has a language model inside it. And we could approach this function design problem in the same way, where we could specify part of the structure that has a functional motif and simply use Rosetta Fold to fill it all in to get a completed sequence and completed structure. And Joe Watson and Dave Jurgens have been using this approach and it's really kind of, it's, it's kind of amazing. So here's, here's a, they're just specifying one small part of a protein of a ferritin that binds two iron uh, atoms. And then they give this as partial information like the few words in your word processor and it just fills it all in to generate quite a wide variety of protein structures that are very stable and bind metal. Um, so, um, so I, I wanted to put just a little bit in about structure prediction. I'll tell you that, these, that this method, which we call in-painting, is, is also looking very powerful for general design of protein function. So using a combination of Rosetta Fold, which is very fast, and Alpha Fold, which was a little slower, but more accurate, we went through and systematically predicted structures for all complexes in the, in the, um, in the yeast uh, genome. And I just wanted to give you an overview of what these look like. And it's, it's, these are, as John and Dennis emphasized, these are just incredibly powerful tools. Um, and you can really systematically go and identify all the interactions in a genome, or at least good fraction of them, and build models. And this, these are just divided by, their, by the process they're involved in. And I also want to make the point that, that when you do this, you can also build models of higher order complexes. And here we had to re we recruit a lot of biologists to help us make sense of these complexes. This is one that's involved in GPI anchor synthesis in eukaryotic cells. And Tamara Hendrickson, uh, who is the world expert on this, or is the world expert, we sent her this complex, and she pointed out all these interesting features of it that we totally hadn't recognized. There's still a huge need or importance of human experts to look at what these algorithms produce. So I want to thank the Wiley Foundation again and all the wonderful people I have um, I have had the opportunity to work with, work, work with uh, Long Jin Kao and Brian Coventry, I mentioned developed the general method uh, for protein binder design. And I think actually I've, 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 I've mentioned everybody who's on the slide, Ming Kyung Bak and Frank DeMaio, really the heroes behind Rosetta Fold and um, Chen Kong and Ian Humphreys did the work on protein interaction prediction. And thanks again to the Wiley Foundation. Thank you, David, really marvelous, thank you. All right, so we now have some time for questions. Uh, to any of the any of the speakers, okay. So we we're going to get other speakers ready for their answers, <laughs> and we'll start here to find um, questions from the audience that are physically present, and spend a little bit of time on that, and then we'll switch to sets of questions from uh, the Zoom audience. And I caught one. I, I think somebody has. Uh, we have lots of hands. So let's get this hand first. And I have another hand here. And then the third one up there. I ask this with some ignorance, and, and this is related to all of you, I guess, work with neural networks, I guess. Once you create and train a network, then presumably it can produce results. And the question is, if you incarnate another network from scratch, will it be the same? Will it be very different? You, brains are different, so our network's different, and have you looked at that? Sure. I think um, the Should answer. The mic, oh, sorry. The answer in part is that it will be different, but it will succeed and fail in very similar cases. So, what you'll find is you always initialize a, a neural network with 20 million random, normally distributed numbers. And then you will come to something at the end of training that will succeed and fail in different cases. And that's why, for example, you run five alpha fold models and take the most confident, but they are very, very similar in many cases. Now in some, or at least you try and drive them to be similar. I think in some cases it's, 
there can be cases where they succeed or fail at random, but you try and drive them out of your system because they make it very, very hard to work with. We definitely did encounter that at the, in certain points. Okay, next. It was great to see all the level of complexity that you're getting with programs such as um, AlphaFold Multima, but I wondered if you could maybe expand on how you're trying to do the same that you've done basically for AlphaFold for the whole Proteome, how you want to expand this, um, especially given that many complexes obviously have multiple members and uh, how you want to use all the kind of covariance analysis and that underlies AlphaFold to, to implement that for the community. I mean, maybe we should start with uh, David, who has some really great work on this. Yeah, well, um, you know, the, the, the great things about these methods is that they already work very well on, on complexes. And I think that AlphaFold alpha fold Multimore that, that uh, John described works even better. But I think the methods are already at the current state good enough, um, as I showed you, to make predictions for um, basically you can pair, make multiple sequence alignments for all pairs of proteins in the organism that you're interested in then give, provide them to the networks to predict the structure. And uh, when you've identified pairs that interact, you can now um, give the network all the multiple sequence lines for all the interacting proteins. And you get beautiful structures out that uh, can come very, very close. Um, so I think John already mentioned that you know, these networks and being trained on monomers have learned far more than just monomeric structure. And uh, by, by, by training on, on higher order complex, one can probably do do even better as in the case of alcohol multimer. Yeah, I, think, I think the way forward, I mean, one of the big cases forward is really just to drive the accuracy of these methods. And definitely the multimeric problem is of the same type, but harder. And so I think what we'll see is as, as these methods improve in alpha fold multimer and the generations that come out of it from our lab and others, that we will start to get more of the completeness on the interactome. And I think that'll be start to be some really, really interesting questions when we start to identify weak interactions and how do we validate and all those others. But I think it'll be very exciting for molecular biologists. I think we had... Um, so there's a lot of interest in modeling protein interactions with other biomolecules, for example, DNA. Um, so my question is, how much do you think the current architecture of AlphaFold is going to need to be modified to solve problems like this? Or perhaps what do you think is the, the main barrier to achieving these sort of modeling? I mean, I think one of the big barriers, I, I, I would say two things. I would say the ideas are probably applicable. Um, taking an alpha fold like system and aiming it at some of these problems will probably take you further than you've been before. The, one of the biggest problems is simply data and its diversity. I think there's a couple, you know, I don't remember how many RNA molecules. I think DNA is a little better state, DNA protein binding, but RNA couple thousand molecules, and then like half of them are ribosomal uh, RNA. So the diversity is very low. So you're going to learn from much, much less data, which will put more stress on your neural network methods. And I think it will require thinking about this and thinking hard about that problem, but we'll certainly see it come onwards. And we don't yet know. We haven't done the really great historical experiment of like how far back in the PDB could we have trained an alpha fold at what accuracy? But I think that's one of the experiments I keep, I keep talking about in talks and never doing, but I will. Um, I think that's, that's part of it, and maybe it will require very different things, but a lot of the principles will be transferable, and then there will be new ideas. It's science. It always is a bit of both. Just to quickly add to that, so I think you know, one of the things we're thinking about as well is we're very interested in those types of problems, but also just building up um, higher and higher layers of complexity. So I think I flashed up as my, I was running out of time my talk about a virtual cell and something I've talked with someone like Paul Nurse for years about when at what point could we try to tackle that and before that you know we're talking about modeling a whole pathway and before that like interactomes. So you can think of us trying to build towards uh, greater and greater complexity and modeling more and more of the biological phenomena. And I think that's the next decade worth of work probably there. So I think we'll switch uh, and try, do you want to come up front or how do you want to? I can read from here. Okay, so, so we're going to have a few questions now from uh, the Zoom audience, which have been curated <laughs> by our assistant. So we have two questions related to conformational states. The first one is for enzymes, would AlphaFold be able to predict different states? And the second one is, does AlphaFold accurately predict Conformational states, for example, pre and post fusion structure of SARS CoV 2 spike protein? I think on the larger multiple state question, I mean, one limitation of AlphaFold is as it's designed, 
it, it has this underspecified problem of what is the structure. And obviously, you know, that's not true. Proteins have multiple states. Now, the differences used to be much smaller than the error in structure prediction methods, so no one worried too much about it, but now we worry a lot about it. Um, what we have observed, and what actually a lot of great external work out of a couple different labs, if I try and say their names, I'll mess it up, so I won't, has been that if you can kind of convince AlphaFold, tweak it, oh, I know Michael Feig, for example, did some work where he didn't provide an MSA, so he made the problem hard, but then he provided a template in the right state, and what he would find is that AlphaFold built off in a sub-angstrom structure of that. And so what it, what it looks like is the kind of geometrization, kind of local structural engine is able to respond to that if you can trigger it into getting the right states. But absolutely multiple confirmations are one of the areas where we think we're either going to have to think a lot more about either being generative and producing many answers for one sequence, or we're going to have to think about how do you specify the conditions which made it pre or post fusion, for example, on SARS-CoV-2. I don't remember if, we, if we've done that. I can't answer that one, I'm afraid. Does anyone want to add in? Yeah. yeah, so just on enzymes, you know, there's something that we're, we're super interested in in terms of enzyme maybe design at some point or um, looking at how they work. Um, we actually have a separate project at DeepMind and our science team on quantum chemistry, which is actually, we just published a nice science paper on the, on the kind of functional that we have there. And at some point, my dream is that these two projects will combine, um, maybe, you know, a decade from now, where we can sort of um, predict electron densities correctly, understand the protein physics, and then maybe understand how it is that enzymes are acting and how they're reducing activation energies and things like that, and then combine that with our protein work. And um, I think that's probably, we're going to need a little bit of chemistry and physics understanding, I would say, to do that. Another question is, uh, what kind of structural motives does AlphaFold use to predict disorder that is beyond the lack of presence uh, in the PDB? I, I mean, I think what it is is that AlphaFold is very, very efficient at finding hints of structure. That when you find hints of structure, it builds a little bit, and once it starts to build, it, it often succeeds. And so it's not that it finds signs of disorder that we know of. It's simply reporting at the end, whatever I did here, don't look at it. And that turns out empirically, if you're, if you're very, very good at your job, then being unable to do something is maybe evidence that it's impossible. And that's really what we're looking at. And I do think that this is a relationship that's going to work best in organisms with strong genetic, uh, with strong multiple sequence alignments like humans and other well-studied organisms and may break down uh, for more, for less common organisms. And something is just going to have to be checked uh, empirically. Uh, if I could just one ask more. one more. We have two more. But uh, this is more about like complimenting all three of you, but then also sharing your insights that you have learned over this period into how nature figures out how, a fold, how to fold a polypeptide in a millisecond time scale. So it's a much higher level question. David, want to go first? You want to go first, David? Oh. You want to take that, David? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it, the, uh, the, different parts of the chain will have structural propensities to form different types of local structures. And I think you saw a nice example of that in, in John's movies. So even though, you know, it's, you know, even though it's a neural network, still, I think that the, the, where you have strong sequence to structure relationships are probably places where you have relatively low energy and where, um, uh, and where the protein would actually, uh, where it's actually folding is, 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 is forming structure. And, um, so as these, as you get this local structure, you know, if you have different parts of the chain flickering between different types of local structures, then there's different ways you can, it can come together. And you saw examples of that in, again, in, in John's movies. And this was very much what the picture of folding we had when we were developing Rosetta in the first place. Um, uh, and then, you know, at some point, you know, there's, when, when everything is coming together in just the right way and the local structures are, are, are adapting to their three-dimensional context, um, then, you know, then, then it kind of clicks together and you get into a, a very low energy state. So I think the reason why it doesn't take the Leventhal time um, is that you have all these local biases um, that, uh, that, that sort of guide the chain as it's folding up. Oh, no. All right, so uh, I know there are other things 
here, but I'd like, and I'm cognizant of time, and we want to close up pretty soon, but there I, I saw other hands uh, going up. There's one right there. Let's take that if we could. Um, I'm just curious about the role of uh, search in training AlphaFold. Is, is there an analog of like the Monte Carlo tree search that was used for AlphaGo, and how much physics knowledge do you need to build into your search procedure to get it to work? Well, I'll, I'll answer the first part of that, and then and then John can add. It's, um, so I think initially we were thinking we could more directly apply an AlphaGo approach to to um, folding. You know, in the in the more kind of literal sense of like the fold it problem uh, again, where you know effectively the players were making moves by choosing a fold. You could sort of ana make that analogous to making a move in Go. So that was the original idea. Uh, in the end we didn't actually need to use reinforcement learning in this system, um, although we did try. I, my suspicion is it would also work if we pushed that hard enough, but it just turned out other, other approaches were more fruitful more quickly and, and, and were easier to scale. So um, that was the evolution of the thinking. So originally the plan was to do more of a direct analogy to the fold it game. But in the end it became more of an inspiration. Yeah, and I think, I think the larger context of this is you can think there are two hard problems, right? There's the problem, if you divide your problem into scoring and search, you still have the issue that you couldn't, in some cases, like in like Boolean satisfiability, the computer science problem, it's very, very easy to check if this is an answer. And if you found the answer on the street, you could find out it was true. If someone walks to you with a protein structure and says, you know, this is the structure of your unknown protein, you would, you would not be able to check, really. You wouldn't be able to verify it. And so I think what it really came in, like AlphaFold 1 was built in kind of this paradigm that we were going to build some constraints and then we were going to search over them. And what we kind of looked at when we really looked at it is when we were doing well, the neural, the constraints just seemed to be just build the structure. And when we did badly, there was no amount of search that would fix it. And so that's, that's I think, how it kind of evolves slowly over time. But I, I totally agree with Demis that this is important and could become more important for things like building large proteins or other cases in which it's just far too expensive to do it in the alpha fold sort of way. And you like the incredible work Jan Kaczynski's done on the nuclear pore that's a thousand chains, right? You're not going to do that with a really big GPU, I promise. Um. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, and I think we'll just do a couple more, one more after that, perhaps. Thank you for the talk. I just have a question. How do you reconcile um, in a real cell you have like chaperons and other proteins that help with folding? And this seems to be based on just mainly the, uh, the sequence of the amino acids and maybe other interactions. So in the future, do you think this will also be incorporated into the algorithms? Okay. One second. Okay. Oh, yeah. First. <laughs> I think, I think what you're really seeing in kind of the diagram that I put on the second slide or so is that no matter what happens with chaperones or anything else, A, the protein must be stable, right? That was kind of one of Anthonson's things. And the stability is really, really encoded in the sequence. And then what you're kind of seeing in the evolution is the encoding of the set of the kind of stable manifold of this protein. So in a sense, you're skipping the dynamical part. I think if you really wanted to get into things like amyloids, you're going to have to get really, really serious about pathway and right, you know, stirred versus quiescent amyloid beta produces different structures. So, so you can't even, it's not even the contents of the tube, it's how you hold it that will determine the structure. And there you're gonna have to get much more uh, serious about the dynamical processes. But for natural evolutionarily encoded proteins, I think that's why, in part, that's really, really complex. We'd love to skip the hard parts. Yeah, I, I think also that, um, just one more comment, that chaperones don't tend to change what the final state is. So most proteins will fold to the, the same final state, you know, in a test tube and uh, in a cell. So they, they largely prevent aggregation. But if you, when you're folding up, your, when you're predicting the structure, you only provide one chain, then those alternate states aren't really even an issue. Yeah, and I was only just going to add one other point, which is that, um, you know, these kinds of learning systems are incredibly good at inferring what's not there. Um, if there's some indent of that, of that missing piece on the bits that you are providing it. So I think we've seen that, for example, with the example that John was talking about with the heme-binding proteins that leave the pocket even though you haven't told it about the heme. 
um, because obviously in the training data there's enough information there to infer this presence of this other factor. Right? Uh, I'm not saying that would solve the chaperone problem on its own, but there's, there's some, um, you know, there's probably some information that's bleeding through uh, the, the data that we're already giving it that's, that's helping with that kind of problem. So I want to give another chance to the Zoom questions. So there's a question on uh, metamorphic proteins, and it is if alpha fold or rosetta fold predicts very different structures from the same sequence. You want to go first, David? Um, let's see. Well, I will say that um, we're, we're that that is a very interesting design problem currently. That um, uh, that um, these methods are turning out to be quite useful for. Uh, but yeah, I'll turn that over to John for the structure prediction aspect. On structure prediction, I would say not necessarily out of the box. Although there's been quite a lot of work in how you make alpha fold less certain. And if you think of alpha fold as kind of falling into one of the basins in the energy landscape, what a lot of external groups have said is if you make the problem harder, if you artificially thin the MSA, if you do other things, sometimes you can convince it to fall the other way. And it's not an incredibly satisfying way to control alpha fold, but it's been somewhat effective. And so I think for a lot of metamorphic proteins, if you can find that evolutionary signature, if hiding in the MSA or hiding in other things, certainly hiding in the physics, both of those have a good core set of interactions. You can probably do it, but we can't give you a concrete procedure to expose them. But if you start to expose them, then the same kind of reinforcement and building engine will build the right structure, I would expect. Wow. <laughs> I think we really have to um, take just one last question. Uh, I see lots of hands. Um, I don't know who's most insist. Okay, we have made a choice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know how many examples there are of this, but I'm kind of interested in proteins that are um, structurally homologous but don't have very similar sequences. Now that you have so many structures, do you think you can use those to generate more general rules that might help predict the effect of mutations on protein structure? Because I know you were saying it's pretty hard to tell what will happen when you mutate a protein because you're only really able to look at these like small scale interactions rather than general rules. Um, maybe, I think, I mean, there's been a lot of work on structural homologs that are very distant in sequence in terms of the search. Like as we make this, you know, all of Uniprot, then there's the question of, okay, with 200 million structures, I don't think you want to look at all of them. Um, right, You're, how do you search this? And like Martin Steiniger and others have started to think about this problem of how do we go and we find the structure, these distant homologs. I think in terms of the mutation problem though, it's almost the opposite. That the real effect of mutations isn't exactly structural. It's normally that a protein has multiple basins, one of which is the unfolded basin, and the mutation affects their relative probability sometimes very dramatically. And so since AlphaFold doesn't really have this conception of global free energy in the way that a system like Rosetta is much closer to um, an approximation of the free energy, you'll have different behavior under mutations. I'll just add, you know, I think that's one of the exciting things about um, the kind of structural abundance world we're in is to sort of see what is like almost like a meta-proteome meta analysis of what can we see across all of this data and I think that's just the beginning of that. We, we would love to collaborate on those kinds of projects to see if there's something we can see. Um, and then one thing I, you know, my hypothesis about uh, the moment AlphaFold is not so good at point mutations is, you know, in a way you can think of the network as being built to be robust to a small change. Um, you know, it wouldn't be good, or good for AlphaFold's overall performance if it flip-flopped, uh, you know, from big structural flip-flops of just one small residue change. But of course, every now and again, a small residue, residue change is, has, does make a huge difference in, in disease and so on. And so, we, you know, we have some various ideas. Um, we're pushing hard on that problem, but we have various ideas of how we might improve that, but it's still um, not a solved problem yet. And I'd like to... Uh... Have David have any last observations on any points, I think, uh, and then we'll draw this to a close. See, well, I, I just want to thank the Wiley Foundation again for this event, and it's a real privilege to be here with uh, uh, Dems and John, who've made such a big breakthrough. And uh, again, Wayne, having you uh, moderate this is just is the, the icing on the cake. So I just want to thank everybody. 
and, this, and the people in my group, I, I feel bad because I skipped through the acknowledges in the slide because I was running late, but um, just all the people have contributed to all the work that I described. Okay. So I want to thank everyone who listened in on Zoom and everyone here, which is a big crowd considering the constraints. And I thank everyone and especially our three awardees for their work and their presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>